All right, we left off yesterday. We were talking about anti-friction type bearings. These are the anti-friction type, which is kind of a funny name because that implies that a plain bearing is somehow a friction type. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. So there's plain and then... And the reason why I guess we can't call it a ball or roller bearing because there's a difference between a ball and a roller. So this one in the middle here, that is a ball bearing. And you can tell that because they have little balls. And this is a roller bearing because it's made up of little rollers. So you have straight and you have taper over here. So taper, is that a roller or a ball? Roller. roller. All right, so we got, got your taper, your straight, and ball. All right, so we said, we're talking about bearings, we have the anti-friction type. Why can't we use roller bearings in things like crankshafts? Is it can't take the forces? Oh, it definitely can. You don't need them. So you're going to use it in higher horsepower engines. Okay. So because it's lower horsepower, they're heavy, it's a moving part, they can fail, so there's... You know, nice thing about plane bearings is not, you know, well, I mean, they fail, but they don't come apart like this can. <clears throat> so, roller type. Roller. <clears throat> All right. Two types. We have the straight type. The straight, it is used only, used only for radial loads. And we have the tapered, which would be used for radial or thrust. Radial or thrust. And those actually, well, I guess all together, they use an inner and outer race. They use an inner and outer race. So this piece right here, uh, ball bearings, they usually just come in one, one piece. Like you get that piece, all right? And even though this would be an outer race and then this would be the inner race, when you get them, it's just all, they're all together and they don't really come apart. But when you get, uh, save over here, but when you get the taper, you always get them in two pieces. So this is one piece sitting up vertically and this over here is the race sometimes called a cup and a cone which is kind of hard and like well which one's which so all i can figure is the cup the cup has the part that holds it so this goes inside so this be the cup this be the cone this is kind of cone shape that's kind of cup shape so cup and cone <clears throat> i'd rather they called it the race but yeah, they didn't ask me so this one right here is tapered so it's used for what kind of loads radial and thrust and this is the not tapered so it's radial. radial so remember the difference radial is strictly this way thrust would be this way and wanting to go out uh, where, where would I actually find something like this where's the common use for this wheels wheels wheel bearings right there uh, you don't use these in wheels I've never seen the tapered used in an engine ever doesn't mean it can't happen, it just means I've never seen it. So, two, and we have the ball. Uh, the ball offers the least amount of friction. Why do you suppose that is? Surface area? Yeah, it's balls have a very tiny little surface area. Least amount of friction. Um, used for radial. Um, or thrust loads, or thrust. It's going to have an inner and outer race, plus a ball retainer. And there is a difference, I say the thrust type, 
used more for thrust, uses a thrust type. Uses uses deeper grooves. Uses deeper grooves. Yeah, I'll show you. So, um, but I'll make this note before I move on. So. Um, may have a thrust side thrust side identified by a deeper groove deeper groove all of the well I'll go to this then I'll come back to that all right so looking at this you can see right here how it's got more of a, a groove so let's say the thrust is going this out towards us, out towards us. Um, so where, where do you actually, in application wise, let me see, we'll go to a picture. Oh, that's the one I wanted. Okay, so here we have a radial engine. So radial engines, and this is a Q&A question, I know that. As far as bearings go, there's gonna be a bearing here, we'll call it, say it's an anti-friction here, we need anti-friction here and anti-friction back here, but there'll be uh, another bearing that goes on the master rod. So follow, so you have crankshaft is held. Let me see, I may have a better picture yet. That's not what I wanted at all. That one. Oh, there we go. Well, thank you for that. There we go. So as it fits together, I said we had one bearing right here. Another bearing is going to go right about here. And another bearing is going to go right up in this area here. So one here one here and one here. And then another one goes on the crankshaft throw. Follow? So four bearings. So starting from the back, this one is gonna be a, is it radial or thrust load? Radial. Very good, radial. So what kind do you suppose it goes there? The what? The straight, the, uh, the roller, the roller. Okay, right here goes on the throw. So that's going to be your connecting rod setup. That's going to be plane bearing. That's a Q&A question. So you have a plane bearing here. Okay. Next one, supporting the crankshaft. Another, no, not a plane. Okay, another roller. So you got a roller here, a roller here. So roller, roller. So that tells you what kind of loads? Radius. So that's handing the radial loads. And of course, like I said, you get your master rod's gonna go on here and has a plane bearing. Then up front, we're gonna have a thrust bearing and the thrust bearing is gonna be? Taper. Not a taper, because I told you I never saw a taper. Yes. Ball bearing. So roller, roller, ball. Let me see. No, I don't have really good pictures. Roller, roller, ball. What are these here? Plane bearings. This one's a roller ball. This one's roller. This one's for radial. This one's for thrust and radial, but mostly thrust. And OK, so we'll come back to these. Um, what was I writing here? So what, where do you find these bearings, right? Mostly used in. Used in radial engines. Or very high, very high horsepower engines. 
and I don't even know what they would be referring to because I've it would definitely not be a conventional opposed engine unless it's gear driven and there'd be some I think in the gear reduction unit and I think some of the older big light coming like the one we walk in and we have the propeller that's just walk in it's right there with the big propeller I think that one had a uh, roller uh, for a thrust um, however you do find small bearings small small bearings roller or ball um, small bearings uh, are used commonly in accessories Yeah. Um, generators. Alternators. Magnetos. Helps with mags. Stuff like that. All right, so going back to this picture. What kind of bearings are these up here? Plane, Plane bearings. All right, this is kind of an interesting looking one here. What is this part right here? This little lip that comes down. This is out of a continental, small continental. That's a thrust bearing. So that's the way continental would, would do this, one of the ways. So how you have your light combing and you just have the two bearings that sit right there, or the newer ones have just one long one in there, and your thrust surface is nothing more than the aluminum case right there, which never wears out strangely enough well continental they actually their bearings take the corner and so this drops down in the front and so this is the thrust face right there so they have a replaceable thrust face and they have to be careful because continental use three small continentals use three different styles of bearings this is a one piece they also made them in two piece where they had you know the the front bearing looked like these right here but just longer well, basically, just didn't have this lip on it, and then that lip was a separate piece that slides in and had a little dowel. And so, if you force this in there, uh, that always cracked and break. So, that was a bad thing. Does the uh, Continentals have an oil cleaner too? Yes, but only one. Only one. Okay, let's talk about the crankshafts. at Christmas or something. Crankshafts. Well, crankshaft, the ba if, the, if the crankcase is like your backbone, then the crankshaft is like your kidneys. Because it converts reciprocating motion of piston and con rods to rotary motion. Converts. Reciprocating, which means what? Back and, forth. Back and forth, up and down. Motion of piston and, and connecting rods, connecting rods to rotary motion. They are forged out of extremely strong steel. Forty-three forty to be exact. Um, I guess this is more of a wow. That's cool. So when they make them, they they actually are pretty big billets, and they're they're forged and they're mach final machined out. And the light coming, they heat theirs to 1,200 degrees and hold it there for 24 hours, and then they take it out of the machine real quick and they check it for runout, just like you guys did, right? You check the runout, and if the runout's bad, they place it on this gigantic hydraulic ram and they press it down for two minutes to straighten it out while it's still hot and release it and see if you get it right. So, kind of funny. 
So I guess I don't need to write that. But we'll just skip that. That's more of a, wow, crazy. Uh, they are nitride hardened. All right, so nitriding is actually an important thing to understand in, in, in aircraft engines because some things are in fact nitrided, some things are not. When you nitride something, you make it very hard. So one of the things about metals is the more carbon you add to it, right, the more, more carbon, yeah, more carbon you add to it, the stronger it's going to be, but it becomes brittle after a time. So you want this really strong crankshaft but more than anything, you want the surface to be strong, but you still want it to have a certain amount of flexibility. Otherwise, it's just strong, and then you, you bump it, and then it breaks. And we don't want that, so you want some give. But if you make it too soft, then the, the surface is going to erode away rapidly. And so that makes a bad thing. So what they do is they do this nitriding process. Um, they put it in an ammonia gas. What is it? Anhydrous ammonia gas. And they put it in a heater with this gas at about almost a thousand degrees for 40 hours. It takes a long time. I, in fact, before I understood the process, I used to send crankshafts off all the time. You know, we'd, I'd measure them out, and especially continental. Continental, you have standard, then you go 10 under. And whenever you went 10 under, and you guys understand what that is now, right? Okay, so you go 10 under, you have to send it out and have a ground down 10 under, and then they would have to re-nitrite it. And so I'd get these calls, you know, from the place that would do the grinding and say, oh man, I'm sorry, we lost your crankshaft and nitriding. You know, it's like, oh, well, can you go look for it? You know, but that's not what they meant. They mean that it didn't make it. It died in nitriding. It, uh, it, it cracked because of the heat or some various thing, got heat cracks or checks or something. So they didn't always make it through the nitriding process. Light combing was a little different back in my day. You could go standard and polish to three and then when you went to six, you had to have it re-nitrided. When you were 10, had to re-nitrite it. But they've since changed that. And they've said, nope, you re-nitrite at three, six, and 10, according to the service bulletin, the newer ones. But what nitriding does, this ammonia gas permeates into the metal. And it goes about five thousandths of an inch deep into the part. And so you have about a five thousandths inch of very hard metal, which gives you that wear characteristic without affecting the base metal. That so you still have a little bit of flexibility. Uh, well, my note says about ten thousandths of depth. I'll write that. So uh, we'll write some of this. By the way, Continental, Continental nitrides their entire crankshaft from one end to the other. Light combing doesn't. They stop at the front after the slinger ring and don't nitride the flange. Their flanges are much softer. But if you look at a, a light coming versus a continental, like you guys, your light coming shaft's about that big around, right? Yeah, the, the, fl the flange. Uh, my 470 is only like that big around. So 520, so continental makes them much, much smaller. So nitride hardened, then that is nitrogen. from A-N-H-Y-D-R-O-U-S ammonia. Don't try that at home. Gas uh, penetrates the surface. Penetrates the surface. Um, that's it was at 40 hours at 975 degrees. So that's hot. Anything that is not that is not to be nitrided is coated with copper. Now you should have a little bit of a oh, wait a minute, I get it moment there. Because a lot of the stuff that you guys have on your engines, you'll notice it has a little bit of copper coloring to it, and you've been trying to get rid of that. Like your camshaft. And, well, if your gears were cleaner, you'd see the gears, parts of the gears are copper coated. Um, some of the newer rocker shafts, or not rocker shafts, uh, idler shafts. Uh, so the cam, we got that. So various things out there 
will have some copper on it. That's to keep that area soft. So especially if we look at the camshaft, every one of the lobes is plain steel looking. Then between it, you got copper. Then you got the lobe, copper. You got uh, the um, journal, copper. So what's the copper? What's the copper there to do? Anti-nitrite. Anti yeah, and so that means the other part is nitrite. So some of you, I know, every year you have a bunch of students saying, I just can't get this copper stuff off. Oh, please don't. <laughs> not that it matters at this point, but it's, you know, not only that, the copper, nothing else, kind of keeps it from corroding. Uh, so what else we got here? Uh, some areas are not nitrated. Some areas not nitrited. Nitrided are prop flange for the light coming. By the way, you know how they pronounce light coming when you go back to light coming? Light coming. Um, what else? Oh, the prop flange for light coming. Um, also, the hanger blades. Oh, that blade hangers, blade hangers for counterweights um, and the gear pad where the gear goes on the back. And it's about 0 0.010 in depth. Max, that's the max. Oh, you know what else is nitrided? Cylinder barrels. So cylinder barrels are nitrided for the most part. We'll talk about that next week. But one thing you got to know, where it's um, nitrided, it will corrode very, very fast. So you got to be very careful. Um, as far as crankshafts go, the opposed engines. Oppose the inline engines and all of the V, V engines, uh, they are one piece, right? Just like yours is one piece. But the radial, radial can be, can be uh, one or one or more, I would say more, because you can have several. I would say one or two, but I guess they get up into three or four pieces, depends. And let me tell you why. Let's see, go back to my radial. We'll come back to those. Radial, radial, radial. There we go, there's a radial engine. It's pretty looking, isn't it? All those little gears, I like that. But if we look at the crankshaft, that's a two-piece crankshaft. So right down here, this right here is the counterweight. This is the counterweight. And so when I see a two-piece crankshaft, that means that the power case is probably going to be a single piece. That's how you get it all inside there. So think about it, right? But um, so you're thinking, well, wait, how does that work? So this piece just bolts on right there. It's got a big old bolt that goes through it right there. And that bolt, you can see a little cutout right there where the bolt, bolt goes. But here's the fun part. It's gotta be perfectly in line. This counterweight has to be the exact same as that counterweight. You can't have two counterweights kind of a little bit because then it won't run straight. So what you do to build it up is you actually have to kind of build this up, put it on there, and then you put it on, because um, this shaft right here lines up with this shaft right here and you have one throw. And so you build it all up. And of course you build it up and you have to put on the, the master rod right there. And it gets all built up on there. I shouldn't have said crankcase. For sure, if you've got a one-piece master rod, that's a one-piece. you got to have a two-piece crankshaft. If you've got a two-piece master rod, like you guys have your rod, the cap comes off, then you can get away with a one-piece. But, yeah, I think I said that right. So you can see that this doesn't come apart. So it has to slide over this, and then that goes on. Anyway, so you put it all together, and then uh, there's a secret, that right there. 
if it's a keyway, there's another notch out of this side. So you pound a keyway in there and it gets you close. And then you tighten up this little bolt to a certain torque and then you put it on uh, um, a V blocks just like you guys do. And you do a run out right about here. And then you do run out back here and you gotta have no run out. If you have run out, then that means this is off a little bit. So you loosen it up and you tap it thousands one way or the other. And trial and error, trial and error. Then you get it and it's fine. What was I talking about? All right, just looks like that. And then when it's all together, there you go. That is a two piece for power section. You know, I kept saying, something didn't show up me. I think power sections are always two pieces. I can't think of any off the top of my head that were single piece. It's too hard to get this together. It's one piece master rod versus two piece master rod. I think it's what I should have been saying. Uh, back to this. Uh, okay, radial engines, one or two more. I'll bring that up a little bit later. We talk about rods. Um, they're generally speaking um, hollow. Why would you make them hollow? Yep, yeah. reduces weight. Reduces weight. And provides oil passage. You gotta have oil going through there. Um, also provides sludge tube chambers, or sludge tube, yeah, we'll call that. Provides sludge tubes, more chambers. I'll explain that in a minute. Yeah, we'll do it now. We'll come back. All right, so there's our crankshaft. What is, let me see, get this going. And there we go, what is this part right here? Um, yeah, these are often called crank pins. This part right here, or right here or right here, or right here. Those would be main journals. We could also call this rod journals. This little area right here, where it, where it makes that little turn, uh, it could be called a radius or a fillet. Right here, we call that a prop flange. These right here are the prop bushings. Right there. And on a light coming, I call that one too. What are those? Slinger rings. Right there is the thrust base. Um, what else? Okay, this right here. That's the cheek. The butt cheek. Um, what else I got? I think that's all I can think of off, of, off the top of my head. I don't know if I have any other. Yeah. I think it's something else. I'll come back to it. Sludge tubes. We're going to get to that. Okay. So this is hollow. Most, yeah, hollow. There were, well, let's back up on here. So if I have on the front of this thing a constant speed propeller. Okay. Well, there's two types of propellers, really. In, any more in use. There were some other ones we'll talk about 
next semester that didn't use oil. They were electric or used gears. But for the most part, anything modern these days, you're either going to have a fixed pitch propeller, which means the pitch doesn't change, or you've got a constant speed propeller where the pitch is constantly varying. So in, a, in an aircraft with a constant speed propeller, as a pilot, as I'm flying, I'm going to set the RPM. I tell my airplane I want 2200 RPM. And what's going to happen is there's a governor that's going to transfer oil through the crankshaft up to the propeller. It's going to set the pitch of the propeller to whatever that pitch needs to be to maintain at 2200 RPMs. That's what I set it at. And I can mess with the throttle all I want. And the throttle, well, not all I want, but within a range, if I firewall it, guess what my RPM is going to be? 2200, because that's going to keep that pitch. I can pull it back quite a ways, and it'll keep it at 2200. Will do. It'll start flattening out, flattening out, and it'll get to a point where the prop won't get any flatter, and then the RPM starts dropping off. But otherwise, it'll do that. Or, you know, if I'm flying along straight and level, and I pull back on the airplane, I start to go up. Normally, the engine will start slowing down, but I said I want 2200, so it'll just start flattening out the propeller. Give me 2200. So we'll talk about that a lot next semester. But the oil has to get to the prop somehow. And the way it does it is it comes through here. This is hollow in here, and it comes out the tube here and goes to the propeller that way, which means for an engine that has a constant speed propeller, this is blocked off back here. So it cannot go backwards and get into the engine. And the way this oil gets up in there is you can see an oil hole right there. Maybe blue is not, dark blue is not the best color choice here. You can see a, much better, a little oil hole there Pretty sure that one's uh, that one goes over to here. There's there's uh, multiple oil holes, but one of these oil holes and it might be that one. We'll say it's this one for now. You have the bearing goes over this and all the way down, and there'll be a little groove. We'll give the bearing some thickness. And there's just a little groove right, stop that. A little groove in that bearing, and that's where high oil pressure from the governor comes into here. So the oil can come in here or go out that way and it fills this up and goes out that way. There's another oil hole that will go through a tube that faces this way. And so that oil will lubricate the whole main bearing. Maybe another one over here, lubricates oil through here, lubricates here, but it also goes through a tube that goes to here. And that little tube then oils this bearing. And there's another tube right here that goes up and oils that one. Another tube there that goes away and oils that one. See how that works? And this one goes, oops, there's a hole on the opposite side over there. It's going to come over here. And so the crank case is going to pressure oil, pressure oil to here. Oops, sorry. Pressure oil to here, pressure oil to here, and pressure oil over here in a couple places. Also, you'll have governor oil pressure coming in here. Hopefully, I, did I confuse you guys too much? It was kind of fast. All right, so it's hollow, number one, so you can get oil back and forth the propeller. Um, you do have these tubes, these little tubes. You never, ever, ever take out these little tubes. I, they do not come out. If you take them out, you've broken the crankshaft. I do not know how they got them in there, and I don't know how to get them out because we're not supposed to mess with them ever, ever. So even if you grind or polish, they just stay in there. You just grind on over on top of them as far as I know. So, all right, so we've got all that going on. And let me clear this off. And by the way, if you don't have a constant speed propeller and you just have a fixed pitch propeller, why then they put a little plug up here and they plug that up and they open this up this way so that any oil that came in this way would, that, that would otherwise fill this up. There's no governor, so it doesn't really, but it can leak in here and just kind of drip out. But otherwise, you're pressure oiling to the bearing, pressure oiling to the bearing, uh, pressure oil to the bearing, pressure oil to the bearing, and then again, it just transfers through. That one goes that way, that one goes that way. This one goes that way and picks up and puts oil that way. So that's how you're getting oil out here. Running through the middle of these, These are hollow, so you've seen that, right? They're, they're open. On modern crankshafts, modern crankshafts, they have these tubes. You might be thinking to yourself, I haven't seen these tubes on my crankshaft. You don't have those tubes. You kind of do, but not quite. 
Um, these are all open, open, and this is only partially open because it's blocked back there. On modern crankshafts, it's all built in and there's nothing to take apart back here. But on the old style crankshafts, like you have, they have these sludge tubes in there. And these, these are actually just hammered. It's a hammer fit, press fit into the crankshaft. And so you'll notice those. With, with these in place, on the older crankshafts, it creates a passage in here that allows the oil to come in from here, fill up this area, and then make it out the hole, because the hole is over on this side. So if you just pumped it through and it got to this point, it would then all leak out of here, right? I hope you can follow my, my crappy drawings. Okay, but, With the sludge tube out, so then what happens is you pressure oil here, the oil goes up into here, and then it all leaks out. So what happens to this bearing? Seizes up. Seizes up, right? Because the hole is over on this side. So by putting in the sludge tube, which is kind of shaped like this, it creates what we call an annulus which means this whole area right here goes all the way around, which you can see in the drawing. And so the oil comes in here, fills up this, and then comes out of here, oils that bearing. That's a great drawing. If you can't look at that and know what's going on, I'll tell you, this is what I mean by it's an annulus. And all of this stuff right here, that's sludge. It's lead, it's nasty, you get, you get it on you. It's almost like you can't get it off. It just keeps on smearing on everything. It's like the cat in the hat in the pink tub. It just keeps going and going. So, but these, when, when you overhaul a crankshaft, like you guys have, you knock them out and throw them away. And that cleans out all the sludge. Yeah, yeah, I have a bag of it. I should I keep thinking, oh, I saved this. I'll show you guys. It's disgusting. It's terrible. <laughs> all right, so what's even worse than all of that is, um, we'll go back to uh, light combing here. So Lycoming had a problem, and these are all hollow up here in the front. And I don't really know why Continental didn't have this problem. I just, they, they didn't, or they do and they never. But uh, Lycoming was getting some broken crankshafts. And what was in service, after service, they were breaking. And I suppose they were cracking right about here. Kind of a bad place to have a crack. So what was happening is the sludge was going up in here and it was building up. And what happens with that sludge is it creates this barrier where water gets next to the, uh, the metal of the crankshaft and the sludge traps it in there and it starts causing corrosion up through the crankshaft until the crankshaft walls get really thin and then break. And so they had this airworthiness directive. I want to say it was anything that was 160 horsepower and higher, which, which was kind of a big deal because uh, the 0320 is such a very popular model. That was the cutoff. Some 0320s were 150, some were 160. So I just forgot about this. So, so the, they came out with a service bolt, and you had to go in there, and you had to uh, open up this cap. And you had to clean all this out, all the sludge. It was nasty. And then you had to inspect it for corrosion or pitting. If it didn't have any, <coughs> then you had to put this coating in there. It was this really weird, aluminized kind of paint stuff. It was bizarre. It was called urethra bond. I can't even spell it. Urethra. I'll just say it was called urethra bond, which is funny because if you know what urethra is. U-R-E-T-H-E. Urethra. Yeah, maybe not wasn't spelled that way, but it sure sounded that way. Yeah. Urethra bond. I think it was spelled a little different. So, so here's the funny thing. So if you know what that is. And then when you did it, you had to mark the crankshaft. And you had to mark it with these initials, uh, PID, which uh, if you know anything about medical, that also stands for something else that has to do with the area around your dick. So I almost think that somebody was having some fun with this. And I think there was, oh, and then the cap that you put back in here, that's so fine. You had to reorder the cap, which is an STD. <laughs> I'm not making this up. So if you know, and if you don't have no medical stuff, well, the wreath is a thing you pee out of a 
that's pelvic inflammatory disease, which yeah. I think is an STD, and STD is sexually transmitted disease. So anyway, you had to do all of that to the front of the crankshaft. So and I, I, sometimes people go, Kevin, I don't know if you're telling the truth. Well, I swear to you, this one is the truth. So, so I tell you that to tell you that, yeah, that's still an ongoing thing, this whole corrosion up here. So it's something you have to be aware of. And even though it's 160 horsepower became the airworthiness directive, the service bulletin, um, which, do you have to comply with the service bulletin? Yeah. No, but the service bulletin says all of their engines. Now, I got to ask you if it's up to you, you know, it's your engine and you've got an O235 that's what, 115 horsepower, would you want to do the service bulletin? Would you say, eh, it's not an AD? I really like my propeller. Uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've grown very accustomed to having the fan up front, it uh, <laughs> keeps me cool. Yeah. If you did have corrosion on there, you were allowed to send it out to certain uh, repair shops and they would actually grind a little bit of the inside to get some of the corrosion out. I've had to have that done and then, then, then apply the uh, urethra bonded. Is there any indication you can look for that corrosion? No. No. So if you think about NDT, I mean, what would you do? Well, I suppose you could use eddy current and uh, ultrasound to do the, uh, the thickness. But you'd have to take this all the way apart and clean, disassemble, clean. Well, at that point, why don't you just pop the cap out and take a look? <laughs> yeah. So that's interesting because when we think NDT, we always think about our fancy processes. But continuously, that is visual. Yeah. Sure. It's like the number one thing. So. Oh, yeah, we're back over here. Okay. So we have the sludge tubes. So the sludge tubes, if you forget to put a sludge tube in, you will seize up the engine. So that's a big deal. I'm not having you guys take your sludge tubes out because sludge tubes are really not replaceable. Once you take them out, you're supposed to throw them away. Uh, sludge tubes, sludge tube chambers. Um, let me see, here we go, sludge. Sludge is mostly lead from combustion product. Lead from combustion. Because remember, we use a lot of lead in our fuel. And so sludge, sludge is slung to the outside. Slung to the outside, to the outside by centrifugal force. Yeah. You know, I can get them out without damaging them, but it's a press fit. And so if you, I think it's a safety issue. Because, yeah, I take them out all the time. In fact, most of these crankshafts that you have, I've taken them out, cleaned them, put them back in or anyway. Or I've found when we built these engines up and took them apart the first time, some of them didn't have sludge tubes, you know, because people just don't know. It, it took them. So they were building them up and I guess running them or something. They just, and I'm like, whoa, we got a sludge tube. So, you know, I went around to other crankshafts laying around like and found sludge tubes and reinstalled them. So we'd have engines that wouldn't seize up. In fact, somebody's got a dark, a really dark crankshaft. And, and I said, well, it may, that one may have been running without a sludge tube. Yeah, because we had some black over there. Yep. Getting really hot. It's, it's very possible. Uh, so the new engines that don't, all the new engines do not have sludge tubes. Lycoming quit that a long time ago. But still, they're hollow in that spot, and you go in there, and it's packed full of sludge. But it's not affecting the engine because it is not uh, part of the oil transfer process. It's just simply hollow in there, and so the oil gets in there, and through the centrifugal force, it separates it out in like a little... What do you call it? Centrifuge in there and separates out the sludge, and so it's it's living in there. Uh, let's see, I already talked about this. Lycoming had a problem with sludge. Had a problem. Had a problem with sludge. With sludge um, trapping moisture. And that became service bolts in 530, yeah, 530, and an AD. Okay, some cranks, not many, not many, are solid. And there are not many because they are heavy, uh, but most are hollow. 
And I guess it's worth saying because, hey, we're in an engine class here, so why not talk about some of the good stuff? Um, let me see. If it is hollow, let me talk about the hollow. If it's a fixed pitch, fixed pitch, you plug the front, plug the front, and open the back. Right? Like my little drawing. If it's a constant speed, constant speed prop, you open the front and plug the back. Um, hesitate to go too into deep. So a loose, I'll just put it loose rear plug can cause prop problems because you're losing a lot of oil back there believe it or not you get into problems with constant speed props where, where mechan or mechanics uh, pilots will complain that it won't maintain its rpm it's always hunting for something hunting or something it's hunting for its proper rpm and there's a lot going on if you really think about it with um, with Continental, Continental is a little bit easier to understand. Let's see if I can get a decent picture. Or we can just use this picture. Let me see. Yeah, we can just use this one. Let's pretend like this is a Continental. Well, with Continental, they're going to put a bearing here and a bearing here, which you understand. And by the way, they also add a thrust bearing. It's separate. And so in order to get oil up to the prop, they take and they bolt something on here that looks a lot like a connecting rod. It's kind of weird. It's, I probably can't draw it worth a crap, but um, it's a transfer collar. It's split right there, and you got a bolt that's going to go through it. And it bolts around there and uh, comes through and has a little a nipple that goes into the case. And so it's just like your connecting rod. If you can picture that, so oil comes in here, and then it goes in a little hole that goes into the center right here. Well, what happens is the clearance between the crankshaft and that that ring start to wear. What happens? Oil starts leaking out of here instead. So all this oil starts leaking out of here instead of going out to the propeller, and so the propeller doesn't get much oil. Okay. Well. Uh, light combing, of course, they just have one bearing that goes all the way across with a hole that lines up with another hole. And of course, the same thing, if you have this bearing all the way through across here and it gets loose, then the oil just starts transferring to where it shouldn't be going and the prop doesn't get enough oil and it doesn't start working. Same thing if this plug back here starts leaking and you got a leak. There's actually a test that can be done, light combing talks about it, where you put a differential compression gauge which you guys will learn about doing differential compression tests on cylinders. We do the same thing on this. We put X number of pounds of air into this and see how much stays in, how much goes to the prop, and you can tell the health of the bearings to see if, hey, am I losing oil here? Is that my problem? Because once this transfer collar, I really thought I had a picture of a transfer collar. Once this transfer collar starts wearing out or these bearings start wearing out, you're just out of luck. You are not going to, um, you're not going to be able to do anything but overhaul it or take the crankshaft out uh, apparently not oh I probably have it in in the prop class or something let's see here that's a decent representation So there you go. There would be, I think, the holes from the uh, case coming into here, pressurizing that, and this hole opened up. It's going to open up that one that actually puts high pressure oil into here, into this section of the bearing that goes to the center of the crankshaft and out to the, the crank. Uh, desludge. You should desludge every 500 hours. I think that was a note that uh, Lycoming threw out at me when I was in, in class. 
I don't have a service bulb attached to it. And why would you do that? Well, to prevent corrosion. And of course, you're only going to desludge the front. Um, and to ensure um, proper proper um, prop operation. operation because as that front crank starts filling up full of sludge it makes the passage smaller and smaller that's going to go into your propeller and you don't want that <laughs> so i would definitely desludge my constant speed every time i took the prop off without a doubt <laughs> well here we go i do sections i do get into the name so sections Sections of the crankshaft. Break time. All right. 